but Jesus named God our Father. I've argued that we need to talk about God as motherly if we're to speak in pictures about God at all and that we do need pictures because otherwise God is ineffable, unknowable. In post two I suggested that this sort of motherly God talk is not absent from scripture. We'll return to the nearly fifteen hundred years in which such talk was more present among Christians in the next post. Now I'll address what seems to me the strongest objection to such talk. Jesus named God Father. Father is one of the commonest New Testament pictures of God. Gradually as understanding that Jesus was God dawned, leading the early Christians towards Trinitarian thinking, Father became the description of the first person of the Trinity, God not Jesus or the Spirit. Jesus once called God Abba, Mark 14.36. This was thought to be the equivalent of Daddy, showing Jesus' uniquely intimate relationship with Father God. See also Romans 8.15 and Galatians 4.6, where Paul speaks of all Christians using this term. By contrast, Father language was thought to be rare in early Jewish writings, and so many 19th and 20th century scholars believed that this intimate Father language was something new in Jesus' teaching. Actually, the statistics of passages in the New Testament where God is called Father suggest that such talk is rare in the Gospels when they are quoting Jesus' own words, except in John, and John's Gospel is often thought to be more theological and at greater distance from events than the others. Talk of God as Father is in fact more common in Paul than on Jesus' lips in the other Gospels. Nor was it in fact so rare in early Judaism either. Alon Goshen Gottstein, in his study of God the Father in Rabbinic Judaism, noted around a hundred rabbinic uses of the phrase Father in Heaven which Jesus uses in Matthew. I concluded the section of the book Not Only a Father that looks at this issue by saying that the early church remembered Jesus as using father language more than Jesus in fact did and that such language was not his own innovation but that he grew quickly in popularity in the early church. Fathers in the ancient world and Jesus talk of God in this conversation about how Jesus used father language it's helpful to remember how the father's role was understood in the ancient world. I'll quote from John Pilch's Handbook of Biblical Social Values. The father, he wrote, is viewed as severe, stern and authoritarian. The mother is viewed as loving and compassionate. Children respect and fear the father but love the mother affectionately even after they're married. So with this in mind read Jesus' best love story that describes God as father in Luke 15. The father reaches out to his child even when the child rejects him. In the light of cultural stereotypes ancient and modern the story is astonishing. The father breaks almost all the ancient cultural expectations abandoning dignity and respect to welcome the return of his errant son. Studies of both ancient cultural stereotypes and the ideas of modern Middle Eastern peasants highlight that this father's behavior was culturally inappropriate. Indeed, the story works because the father's behavior is a surprise. Imagine if Jesus had told the story of a mother. Do you think it would have had the same power? Other places where Jesus uses his father language about God also transgress cultural norms. Jesus describes fathers who feed and clothe their children, give gifts to bad as well as good children, forgive rather than punishing, though the father does judge in a couple of places. God, as Father, deals with infants and little ones. This Divine Father that Jesus talks about often acts in ways that fit the ancient world's cultural stereotype of mother better than the expectations of fatherly behavior. Some of these stereotypes are still at work today. How have you experienced them? Jesus was male, so God is in some sense more male. Many people talk about Jesus' maleness and seem to think that this means that the second person of the Trinity is male. I think this reasoning is a mistake. In technical language not everything we can say about the word incarnate, Jesus, should be said of the second person of the Trinity. So Jesus had eyes of a certain color, but we can't say this of God, or even just of the second person of the Trinity. Jesus doubtless had liking for certain foods, but God does not. Such human characteristics would, if we transferred them to our talk of the Godhead, result in God becoming a member of one group of beings that excludes others. So if a god, small g, had brown eyes, the most likely color of Jesus' eyes, then that god, with a small g, would not be part of the group of blue-eyed beings. 
therefore to attribute such characteristics to the godhead is idolatry worshipping a god with a small g who's a member of certain classes or groups of being but not of others early christian theologians were therefore quite clear god has no gender god is not a member of any class of beings this applies to the genders male and female as well as eye color or food preferences what do you think do you think any of jesus of nazareth's physical attributes tell us about what god is like this makes it complicated if god does not belong to any class or group of beings then all our pictures of what god is like are in some ways wrong as well as right false as well as true god is like a rock he's a strong protector but god is not like a rock rocks are unable to respond that's why i see the first in this series we need complementary pictures to minimize the error picturing god as a father is a better image of what god is really like if we use the picture of god as mother as well it seems so simple in everyday life two loving parents are usually better than one so how come our everyday christian language does not reflect this in the next post i'll introduce a millennium and a half of christian thinking that did use such motherly pictures of god another question for you today what other feminine pictures of god might be helpful besides mother god bless bye for now <laughs>